Hey. All right. Welcome back, welcome back. Oh, I want to say it this time. This is Christopher Harrison, still. Still. And I'm still John Galloway. <laughs> and we're still talking to you about Bootstrap. We are still talking to you about Bootstrap. Um, so up until now, um, we've seen our grids. We've seen what we can do inside of uh, Visual Studio. Um, but it's now time to sort of take everything that we've done, um, I think, to a certain extent, to the next level. That one of the biggest questions that we've seen all day has been, hey, I like to use fill in library here. So I like to use jQuery UI, or I like to use, you know, whatever else it is that, uh, that it happens to be. And uh, the question then became, all right, well, when would I use Bootstrap and when would I use fill in the other library here? And one very big thing to keep in mind is that the two aren't mutually exclusive, that you can absolutely use fill in the blank and Bootstrap. Now, there might be some conflicts in some of the different attributes, in some of the different class names that they use, um, and all of that's because, of course, all of these are generated by different vendors, by different uh, organizations. But at the end of the day, it's simply CSS, JavaScript, HTML. That's, that's, that's what Bootstrap is. So you're still free to use whatever it is that you want. Now, one big reason, uh, or one big library out there, I'm going to do it this way, that gives you some of the enhanced capabilities that you see in a lot of web pages is a little library known as jQuery UI. And jQuery UI makes it very easy to create tabs and accordions and modal dialog boxes and all of those different things. Well, since Bootstrap really is focused in on the UI, if you're looking to do um, MVVM model view, view model, or anything fancy like that, Bootstrap is there to display your data, not to help you manage your MVVM. That's where you have things like Angular and, uh, and Knockout. So Bootstrap, being focused on the UI, is going to give you capabilities to add on and display all of those cool little things. And that's exactly what we're going to take a look at in Module 5 here, JavaScript functions. Now, like I mentioned, um, this was sort of a uh, bait and switch. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're actually not really going to take a look at JavaScript. We're actually going to see, I think, basically no JavaScript throughout this entire module. And that really is by design because you're going to notice that most everything that we would want to be able to do, we can do without JavaScript. If you want to do it, or if you want to customize it with JavaScript, a lot of these different things you can write out of the box, not a problem. But I really want to focus in on being able to do all of this declaratively to make your life a little bit easier. So that way you don't necessarily have to write JavaScript for every little thing that you're trying to, uh, to do. So what we want to see here is we'll talk a little bit about Bootstrap JavaScript. We'll talk uh, Bootstrap and JavaScript. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to enhance the UI and then how to interact with, um, uh, with the user. Now, like I mentioned, Bootstrap does come with a, uh, a handful of different functions. You are going to notice that uh, you've got Bootstrap JS. That's the full-blown JS files You know, with things like carriage returns, tabs, and then we've got Bootstrap Min JS, and that's the minified version. That's the one that you want inside of your pages. In addition, you're going to notice that jQuery is required. Now, keep in mind, if you're manually going in and doing your references, that the order in which you reference your um, the order in which you reference your JavaScript files is important. So you'll need to make sure that it's jQuery first and then Bootstrap second. Although with I think almost every library out there, mm -hmm. it's jQuery first and then everything else after that. And then last but not least, and just to reiterate it down there at the bottom, is the fact that again, most of the functionality is enabled by just simply adding on attributes or adding on classes. So you basically, you just provide the structure, and then away you go from there. One of the biggest questions that I saw kind of passing through today was, how do we create a modal dialog box? Everybody wants a modal dialog box. <laughs> so how do we do it? Well, as it turns out, it's simply configured using a series of classes and a little bit of structure. Now, you are going to notice is it takes a little bit of lead up work to make all of this happen. 
So we're going to notice that we are going to have a couple of containers. We're going to have one all up container that's going to need a class creatively called modal. We are going to need our actual modal dialog, which is going to be inside of another container. And then finally, we can provide our content where we'll have our header, our footer, and then the actual content itself. So we just go in and, and define all of, uh, all of those. Then when it comes time to click on something to launch it, all that we need to do is add in two little attributes, the toggle and the actual ID. Now, the data toggle here of modal, it must be modal. That tells Bootstrap, hey, when you click on this, this is going to launch a modal dialog box. The data target, however, this is going to specify which modal dialog it is that you've defined. So inside of here, you're going to specify ID equals, and then whatever the name happens to be, the ID that you provide here needs to match that ID there. And you'll notice, by the way, that you are going to use a pound sign to identify that ID. And then finally, last but not least, of course, you're going to want to be able to close out your modal dialog box. And you're going to do that just by adding on to whatever button it is that you might want, data dismiss equals modal. OK, I'm going to do sort of two things here. I'm going to get a drink of water. <laughs> And pat your head. <laughs> and pat my head. Um, I don't want to mess up my hair. Um, I know the feeling. <laughs> In any event, um, I am going to bail out of my slide here, and I'm going to get into, uh, into Visual Studio. Um, discard and, oh, uh, Visual Studio. There we go. And Bootstrap MVA demos. OK. Now, you're going to notice that I'm going to take a different tack than I normally do. That uh, typically, what I'll do when I'm doing my demos is I do them live. Um, and that, of course, always leads to the possibility that something could go wrong. Um, some people would call it a certainty, but whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> haters. <laughs> haters, haters. Um, the challenge that I have here is that there's so many structure or so much structure and so many different classes to go in and set up that I just wanted to make my life a little bit easier. So I went in and built all of this um, in uh, in advance here. Um, but you know, before we go any further, it, it it would also be nice to go in and say Control K, Control X, and then go to Bootstrap, and then you'll notice that inside of here they have basically anything that you might want uh, inside of here. So if you want a modal dialog box, just simply go in, find that little modal, and that will give you the full outer structure of what you might want. And, and I really kind of like the, the layout that they've given you here, is that here is our uh, content, here's our header. I had a typo on that other slide. I said uh, modal content twice. It should have been modal body. Um, and then uh, finally, last but not least, I'm going to fire my editor. <laughs> my editor is me, by the way. But down at the very bottom is uh, is the footer. So they've already got all of that all set and ready for uh, for you to use there, kind of make your life um, uh, a little bit easier. To make my life even easier, I've got all of this pre-baked. Now you're also going to notice that up at the very top I've got my CSS, but down here at the very bottom, there they are, are my little scripts. And uh, where those scripts are, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, I put them down towards the uh, very bottom. I put the modal underneath my scripts, and that was sort of a design decision that I made kind of real quickly as, as I was uh, putting this together the other day. Um, just because typically, you know, your modal dialog boxes, that's just, you know, stuff that's going to be displayed at some point. So uh, frequently people will put those types of things down at the bottom of the page that if it's not going to be displayed right away, let's just sort of bury it at the end. Um, and that's what I've done here. So I just want to mention that I could have very easily taken all of this, put it up uh, towards, the, uh, towards the top there and had it above the scripts, I put it down towards the bottom um, just to kind of simulate hiding it. Sure. OK. So I want to talk about what it is that, uh, that I've got here. So uh, what I've got is I have my div container. And you'll notice that there is my uh, class modal. 
And this fade option here is going to give you that little bit of animation that's going to, you know, make that uh, make that appear, um, fade in, if you will, as opposed to just bam appearing right there on your screen. Then you're going to notice that I have uh, specified my class for modal dialog, and then there is my content with again my header, body, and footer respectively. Now, over here on my uh, little header. You're going to notice that I've got two items here. The first is going to be the actual title. And you'll notice it says right there, modal title. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be our typical, are you sure? Then you're also going to notice that we've added in a little button closer. And that's going to put the little X up at the upper right hand corner that everybody wants inside of a modal dialog. So that's going to put that right up there at, uh, at the very top. And then the little um, amper times. Amper is going to give you the uh, the X that uh, that we want there. So you know times is in a time symbol, you know, aka X. In any event, there's all of that. Then of course we've got the body. Now in my case, I kept it very simple. But somebody did ask earlier. Well, Christopher, what about putting in a form? Okay. Well, just simply add in a form. We'll say role equals form. Uh, we'll go in and say um, class equals form um, horizontal. There we go. And then we'll go ahead and uh, you know what? Um, KX and we'll say bootstrap and we'll say ah, I want my form group uh, horizontal. There we go. Boom. And then we'll uh, give this uh, real quick name of email. There we go. Um, email just like that and type equals uh, email. Perfect. All right, so you know that would just add that right in, and then if I wanted to, I could then go in and add a uh, button into here. Type equals um, uh, button, and then class equals btn, and let's say btn uh, default, whatever it is that you might want it to uh, to be. Um, submit uh, email. So you'll notice that I could put whatever it is that I want inside the body. So if you want to create a modal form then create a modal form. You can still use the exact same modal. All that you need to do is just add that form text inside of there. I left a basic paragraph tag inside of there because what I'm trying to do is focus in on creating the modal, not focus in on, on creating forms. I'm trying to keep this as straightforward as possible. So let me just um, P and insert some um, bacon um, ipsum um, text here. And again, there's a whole bunch of them. There's a, a vegetable um, ipsum. There's like a a, a snacks ipsum. Um, it's it's crazy. Just mm -hmm. you know, do a search for ipsum gem generators. In any event, okay. So are you sure? Add in my little bit of uh, modal down there. And then finally, last but not least, <coughs> is my data dismiss. What data dismiss is going to do is when you click on it, that's going to close the modal dialog box. Now, closing the modal dialog box is going to be very important if you're going to stay on the same page. Because, of course, the whole concept of a modal dialog box is that's going to gray out the entire page behind the scenes. So, if you want them to do something on the same page, then you will need to do a uh, data dismiss on it. The biggest reason that I mention that is for those of you that might be creating single page apps or SPAs. That with an SPA, what's going to happen is it's one page. So I need to show hide and otherwise. So even though you might be saving your changes with my little commit that I've got right here, even though you might be saving the changes, you're still going to want to make sure that my, uh, your uh, little screen closes. So you're just going to want to make sure of that, and that's where my data dismiss modal comes into play. Okay, so now let me go in and a little Control F5, and oh, ha! You know. Like I mentioned, I had um, actually set this up uh, the other night, and what I'm just now realizing is uh, this morning I had gone in and updated my version of jQuery. So there's what happens if you go in and <laughs> update jQuery. Um, there you have it. Let's uh, let's try that again. Perfect. 
So I can type in whatever my title is. Um, John sings the blues. <laughs> I and, sure do. Uh, John Galloway. There we go. And we'll tap save changes. And sure enough, you'll notice, are you sure? And it flies right in. And then if I hit cancel or commit, they're both going to do the exact same thing. They're both just going to make that little screen disappear. So you're going to notice that, hey, I didn't actually need JavaScript there that I did all of that without a look at JavaScript, just provided the appropriate structure, provided the appropriate classes. All right, let me go back to my slides here. And there we go. OK, now let's get in and take a look at, uh, at alerts. Here's the catch about modal dialog boxes. Modal dialog boxes are, well, modal. It's not just a clever name. And so what's going to happen with a modal dialog box is it's going to gray out the entire page. If you want to access the page behind the scenes, you're not going to be able to do so. That this is a dialog that refuses to be denied. It must be dealt with. It must be handled. Um, that in programming terms, it's almost sort of like throwing an exception. That if you throw an exception in code, something must handle it or your application is going to crash. Same concept with a modal dialog box. It must be handled, it must be closed, or they're not going to be able to do anything else on the page. So that is nice if I need to focus attention on just one little spot. That is nice if I don't want my user to go anywhere else until they've dealt with this. But what happens if I just want to pass on a little bit of information? So for example, maybe I'm creating a single page app and the user goes in, they fill out the form, they click Submit, and maybe I'm going to hide the form, and I just want to let the user now know, hey, look, we have saved your changes. Or maybe what happened is the form failed validation. So they clicked on Submit, maybe they forgot a required field. So I want to put a dialog up towards the very top that says, hey, by the way, this form has errors. Or maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, submit the form, and maybe there's a problem on the server. And so that's now failed out. And so now I want to let the user know, hey, something has happened, and I want to put that out onto the page. So it's a nice, more subtle way of letting the user know the state of, of something. Um, you know, that, that's an important thing. You, you, that balance is really important. Like, yes. Because users get really frustrated when things don't work and they don't know why. So you need right. to bring something to their attention. But you don't want to be like Clippy, like, hey, hey, hey. You know, so, <laughs> bring back Clippy. Right. So, I, I was actually more of a the, the dog kind of guy. There you go. The dog yeah. was nice. Um, or Merlin. But, but the important <laughs> thing is you want their attention, but you want to do it in a nice, like, hey, by the way, buddy, you need to do this thing. You know? Exactly. So, so this is kind of a nice balance there. Exactly. So. Yep. Yeah. Now, stop me if you've heard this before. In order to set this up, all that I need are classes. And there's really just kind of two main classes that I'm going to need here. Number one is alert. And number two is alert type. And you'll notice that we've got success, info, warning, and danger with all of the different colors that are, uh, are listed there. And you also have the ability to make the alert dismissible, meaning that if the user clicks on it, it will disappear by just adding on the alert dismissible class. Now. Let me go in, take a look at my slides here, or my slides, uh, take a look at Visual Studio. Um, escape and discard, and there we go. OK. Now, down at the very bottom, you're going to notice that I've got my alert. Now, you're going to notice that I had it down at the bottom, partly to hide it. And you're going to notice that I had it hidden down there at the very bottom. Now. The reason that I had it tucked down there is because of the fact that, well, there isn't a JavaScript function to make an alert appear. There's an awful lot to make it disappear, but there's nothing to automatically make it appear. Now, fortunately, it'd be very easy for me to go in and do that. And when we get into real world, I'm going to show off a very simple way that you could go in and create your own little function that would make an alert appear on, uh, on your page. Um, now, the other big thing to keep in mind is that if you would be doing that, it is going to require a little bit of placement, because at the end of the day, this is just HTML. And, and if I bring up the browser here, um, Uemon browser, um, 
you're going to notice down there at the very bottom that that's where the alert is. The reason that it appears down there at the very bottom is because of the fact that all it is is it's just HTML. So unlike the modal dialog, which is flying in with a bit of JavaScript there, this is almost just to a certain extent just kind of static HTML, boom, that's, that's where it's going to be. So if I wanted this, and let's go ahead and do it, up at the very top here, let's say that I maybe just put that into my container. There we go. And then let's uh, save and hit refresh. Now you're going to notice that it's up at, uh, at the very top. So the first big thing that I want to mention about alerts is that they're great for page to page. So let's say, for example, that I've got an order or an entry form of whatever it is that it happens to be. And when you click on submit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back to the index page, or I'm going to take you back to the list page. One of the problems with that is, how do I know that the prior page actually did something? Well, a very simple way to add that into there is just by adding in an alert. So you can just hard code that HTML in, and away you go. Again, if you are doing an SPA, single page app, mm -hmm. or if you did want to make this appear dynamically, all that you would really have to do, it's, it's very simple, is just add in the little bit of code to oh, um, just append that bit, of, um, uh, that bit of HTML in. You know what? I'm just going to give me two seconds here. Um, let's just do it. You know. So down here at the very bottom, um, let's go in and let's just simply say um, script, and let's go ahead and say um, dollar paren, and let's say function, and there we go, and let's go in and say dollar paren and pound commit um, changes, and when you click on that function, you really did say there was going to be no job. Uh, you know, I lied. I'm, I'm, but something tells me, and I don't have the chat window open, but something tells me this is going to make somebody very happy. Um, var alert um, HTML equals, and all right, this is going to take just a couple of seconds here. Um, let's go in and kind of format everything. Plus. And there we go, and there we go, ah. plus there we go. Okay, there we go, and let's just go in, uh, let me just create a real quick um, container for this. Um, where am I, where am I, where am I? And let's go in and say um, div, and I'm just going to say id equals alert container. There we go. And dollar paren, and let's just say alert container, and let's say append and my alert, oops, HTML. Okay. And I'm doing this all on the fly, so I think I'm right. I did have the, the button kind of pre-programmed um, in case I had an opportunity to sneak that in, which I did. Um, and there is that. I think I'm good. We're going to find out here momentarily. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's just go in, hit save, um, hit refresh, and let me click save uh, changes and hit commit. And there we have it. Up at the very top now, there is my alert. So again, you know, very easy for me to just add on that little bit of functionality. And if you don't mind my belaboring the point, I just want to highlight this one more time. At the end of the day, all that this was, from our perspective, was just HTML and a bit of CSS. So I can very easily, automatically, dynamically create this on the fly and just add this in as, uh, as I see fit. OK, cool. Well, let's go back in and kind of keep on keeping on. Do, 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 do. Well, let's talk about providing help. Creating web applications is sort of a funny business because we're creating an application. And we're creating an application where we're not going to typically provide a user manual. I'm not going to tell you how to use this. All that I'm going to do is simply say, here, 
figure it out on your own. And even if it was maybe an intranet app where you did create uh, documentation for it, um, chances are nobody's gonna read the documentation anyway. So we need to make sure that we provide inline, ha uh, inline help. And fortunately, this is very easy for me to go in and do. And there's really two main ways for me to do this. One way for me to do it, oops. Gotta draw my screen. There we go. Um, one way for me to do this is by setting up a tooltip, which simply means that if you put your mouse over something, we'll give you a little tooltip and explain what it is that we're trying to do. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can also generate a popover. Now, the thing about a popover is it requires a click. So you click on it and then it will pop something up and it could be above to left to the bottom to the right. And what's nice about a popover is that a popover is a container for HTML. So if you need to provide something more robust, if you need to provide a, a full paragraph, if you need to provide 27 eight by 10 color glossy photographs with circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one <laughs> explaining what each one was to be used as evidence against us, you could do that as well. Speaking of obscure references. <laughs> so you have full capability to determine how you want to provide that feedback. So again, tool tip, just simply mouse over, that's it. Pop over, it requires a click. However, you get a lot more structure and a lot more data that you could go in and, uh, and provide. Now, I've got a tooltip um, already pre-baked. And what I really like about tooltips is the fact that A, they're a bit more subtle. That one of the things I always try to teach my users is when in doubt, right click or stop moving your mouse. That if you're looking for something that you can't find, right click, chances are it's there, or Stop moving your mouse, chances are something will come up on your screen to tell you exactly what it was that you should have been doing. And what's very cool here is setting up a tooltip is really done in three basic steps. Step one, data toggle equals tooltip. Step two, data placement equals top left, right, or bottom. Step three, title, that's what I want to display. So when I now go into my little page here and I put my mouse over anywhere on that group, you're going to notice that right up there at the very top, stay there, well, it sort of faded out and I was afraid of that. Um, you'll notice that there is my, the ghost of my, uh, my album title there, as it were. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, kick on back to slides here. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay. Now, up until now, what we've really been looking at is sort of interacting with the user. Hey, I want to give you a little bit more information. Hey, we want, you know, make sure you pay attention to this. Modal dialogues, tool tips, things like that. Now what we want to do is we want to take a look at how to best serve up large pieces of data. Now, one way that we can do this is by setting up tabs. And the way that tabs are going to work is you're going to have, yep, you guessed it, up there at the very top, tabs. And as you click on each tab, the bottom section down here is then going to swap out and be replaced by whatever text it is that you want. So this is nice where I want to give my users the ability to bounce around from one part of the data to the other, but typically they're not going to read it from top to bottom. So again, tabs are perfect for data where there's a fair amount of it. I don't necessarily want them to read from top to bottom, and I want them to be able to bounce around. That's what tabs are all about. Now again, tabs are going to require a bit of setup. And coming back to my slide here, you're going to notice that it's really two parts. The first part is going to be defining the tabs. And you'll notice that this is done by defining an unordered list with a class of nabs, but in particular, nav tabs. And that's what's going to tell it to go up there. Then what you're going to notice 
is that I'm going to add on all of my different links here. And there's really two main things that I need to do on my links. Number one, data toggle tab. That's going to tell it to be a tab. And then number two is I need to set the href. The href, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to lose my voice by the end of the day, I swear. <laughs> um, give me a second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, in any event, the href, right here, you're going to notice pound reviews. Your CSS quiz for the day, what's pound? It's an ID. ID, yes. So, what you're going to notice is that reviews points to that, profile points to that, and account points to that. You do need the pound. And so that's what's going to determine what will, in turn, display right inside of that little tab box. So, if I kick over to Visual Studio here, there we go. And again, I've got all of this pre-baked, making my life easier here. Scroll on down. Here are my little tabs. And you're going to notice that I've got a little header there for tabs that's just for dis display purposes. And then what I want you to notice is that just as I promised, there is the top lock right there. That's going to give me my tabs themselves. Down here, there's the content. And you're going to notice href, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And then you'll notice my IDs. The active, by the way, is just going to identify that that's going to be the first tab or the one that, that I want active. So if I fire this page up, there we go. And let me, perfect. You're going to notice there's my tabs. And I click on the second. I click on the third. I click on the fourth. I click on the fifth, and it will display my data right inside of there. Now, I could also have gone in and set a, a height as well if I uh, so desired. Um, I just wasn't overly concerned about, uh, about doing that. So there's my tabs. Now, rather than going back to the slides, I'm just going to keep it here um, because I think it will give us a nice ability to kind of just keep comparing and contrasting here. Because you're going to notice the next demo here is on a little thing called Scroll Spy. And scroll spy is very similar to tabs. That you're going to notice, just like our tabs, if I I swear to you, <laughs> this worked yesterday. <sighs> All right, in any event. <laughs> uh, this worked well, yesterday. Well. Um, but um, so let me just talk through it. Um, here's what I want you to notice. So bacon uh, ipsum is stop, uh, stripped steak is second. Um, so if I click first, it's going to take me to bacon. If I click second, um, the display is off. And I think there's just a, a relative positioning thing there um, that's off. I'll have to go in and look at it at, um, at break. Um, but in any event, what I want you to notice is that up at the very top now is strip steak. Prosciutto is third. If I tap on uh, third, you're going to notice that it's prosciutto. So it's doing exactly what we had up top of the tabs, that similar behavior. But the big difference is when I scroll up and down inside of here, what you're going to notice is that my little tabs automatically highlight there. The other thing that I want to mention here is the overall display. That if I want to look at second in the tabs, I have to click second. It's the only way that I'm going to see it. But inside of here, I can go in and scroll up and down to go find the data that I'm looking for. So again, it's really a matter of what type of data are you trying to serve up. That if you're trying to serve up data where people are going to typically read from top to bottom, but I just want to be able to show them what section they're in, Scroll Spy is perfect for that. If it's data, but people typically don't read from start to finish, and I want to give them the ability to bounce around. That's what tabs are perfect for. Now, accordion is sort of similar to tabs in Scroll Spy. That what accordion is going to do is sort of that same thing. That it's going to only allow us to look at one section, just like tabs. But like Scroll Spy, it's going to be vertical rather than horizontal.
So this again is great for serving up data where I don't expect people to necessarily want to read from top to bottom. I just want them to go into um, different sections. Or it's also perfect for a parent-child type of relationship. So uh, maybe an item details. So I would show them the title of the item and then uh, if they click on it, I would then show them the details accordingly. And then you'll notice that if I tap on second here, my second works, my third works, my fourth works, and my fifth works. Now, let me go back to Visual Studio here uh, real quickly. And I'm just going to collapse that away. Hmm. Just. It's like Kermit the Frog? Um, something like that. Um, I'm just going to. Um, oops. Uh, position. Um, oh, not class. Ah. Um, style equals. While I'm doing this, um, one of the uh, little disadvantages um, to using the, um, the functionality here is that unfortunately it, and that didn't fix it, um, it doesn't give you an error message frequently. It just doesn't behave the way that you expect it, which can certainly be a pain. Um, one of the keys that I want to highlight about Scroll Spy is whatever's containing the data needs to be flagged with position relative. And you can actually see that down there at the, uh, the lower right hand corner. Um, in any event, setting up Scroll Spy is very similar to setting up tabs. That what you're going to notice is just like with our tabs, there's the navigation block right there. And then down below, there's our data. Also, just like tabs, I'm going to set up my little links. And you're going to notice there's my IDs. And that's going to point down to my IDs down below. And then the last big thing that you're going to notice here is the fact that on my little nav section right here, that it doesn't mention anything about being scroll spy. Now, there's the ID there, but the ID is sort of irrelevant there, that the ID is just the ID that I chose to use there. What's actually making the magic happen is the data that you're going to notice on the data that I've got my data target being nav spy. That is what's going to create the link back to there and keep everything rocking and rolling and, uh, and moving along uh, correctly. The last little thing that I want to mention here um, is my data spy scroll. That's what's going to keep everything updating as I scroll up and down. And then last but not least is my height and my overflow. That's just CSS. That's technically not needed. But what I wanted is I wanted that little box effect, and I wanted my scroll bar over there. So setting my height to 150 is going to determine the height. If it turned out that we wouldn't have enough room, what do we do? We scroll. So that's what's creating my scroll bar for me. OK. And then last but um, not least for the data section anyway is the, is the accordion. And you're going to notice here with our accordion, again, kind of the same thing. Take some setup. But unlike before, it's not going to be my navigation in one section and my data in another section. So you're going to notice that it's going to be a set of panels. That's going to identify my blocks. And then at the top of each panel is going to be the header information. And then below that is going to be all the data that I want to put inside of there. You'll also notice that I need to identify everything with, um, uh, with ID. Now, I have to admit, I, and, and I'll do this when, uh, when we're on break, um, so I'm not seeing the chat window right now, but I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts there's somebody looking at the accordion and they're saying, you know what? jQuery UI makes this easier. I'm not going to argue that point. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> That's it. OK, now the last little thing I want to show off here um, is that little um, uh, image uh, carousel down there at the very bottom. Um, and you'll notice that it's just on a timer there. Um, however, if I do click on it, you'll notice I can have it move um, back and, uh, and forth there and just kind of loop through. I also want to mention that while this is uh, looping through there, that this doesn't have to just be images. Images are, of course, standard. It's what you would typically use. But it doesn't actually have to be um, 
images down at the very bottom. By the way, the this is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end is it's sort of a, a reference to Animaniacs um, and the doors. In any event, there was an episode of Animaniacs. This is the beginning, the beginning of our uh, story. This is the middle, the middle of our story. This is the end, the end of our story. I'm really just proving <laughs> I'm a child of the late 80s, early 90s. Now, um, with our carousel, a couple of things that are worth highlighting. Number one is sort of like before. You've got your navigation section up top. That's exactly what that is. And then down below, we've got our slides. There's the outer wrapper for the slides. And then there's item one. There is item two. And then there is item three. Now, again, I used an image. You're not required to use an image. You could just put text inside of there. And you'll also notice just down below that is the, uh, is the little div tag uh, as well for our uh, caption. And that's what's making the beginning, the middle, and end of our story appear. OK. Last thing, then, that I want to mention, if I go back to my little screen, is this little block right over here. That you'll notice that as I scroll up and down, that it's staying put. And you'll also notice that if I click on Scroll Spy or Tabs, that it will take me around to my different spots. Oh, um, I apparently have a mistake on my carousel demo, but that's okay. Oh, that's funny. I know exactly what my problem is. Um, in any event, so you'll notice that they're all right there. Now, what's making that happen is a little thing known as a fix. And a fix takes a little bit of setup to get just right. That um, of all the different uh, items that, uh, that are there, some of them are very simple, some of them take a little bit of work. This takes a fair amount of work. Um, first of all, what you're gonna notice is on my body, I have my data spy equals scroll, which is what's gonna keep everything up to date over on the left-hand side. And I've got my affix nav, and that's going to tell it what to update. You'll also notice there's my navigation section. You're going to notice that I am going to tell it to take up space in my container just like I would anything else. So call mid2, and that's now just going to appear over there on the left-hand side. You're going to notice that it is set for a fix. You're going to notice that I only want it to be 40 pixels from the top. And then you're going to notice down below that I list off all of my different tabs with, again, the hrefs set to each spot. And let me fix that little typo right there. You'll also notice right here, there's my href scroll spy demo. And then there is my href scroll spy demo. And by the way, I noticed I've got one other little issue there. Um, let me... I'm just going to go in and fix this real quick. Um, class equals active. There we go. And then let's just go in. Since we've got our tabs first, we may as well have them first in our scroll spy. There we go. All right. So now there is my um, scroll spy up at the very top, um, my tabs, my accordion, and my carousel. And I think I still, I messed something up. Um, ah, I had it right the first time. See, John, never doubt yourself. What about the second time? Should you have doubted the first time? Okay, now I'm just confused. See, I had it right the first time. I just, I got myself confused. Um, that's why, because I had collapsed my tabs. I didn't see it right away. In any event, okay. So, the goal of all of that was to show off how we can interact with the user just by going in and setting up a bit of HTML. Now, does it take a little bit of work? Absolutely, but again, Take advantage of cool little tools like Bootstrap Snippets, which are going to make your life that much easier. That really, once you get that initial structure set up, that I think was the hardest part for me to get into. Once you get that initial structure set up, getting it from there is actually relatively straightforward. All right. So. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a fair amount. So what do you say we, uh, we take 10 minutes, Yep. and then um, let's come on back, and we're going to see how many times we can make the joke, less is more. Mm. We'll see you guys back here in time. <laughs> <laughs>